My relationship with the second generation of Pokemon is weird. If you've already seen my videos about Sapphire and Red, then you know I grew up with those two games, watched their seasons of the anime, collected their Pokemon cards, owned their toys. They were an integral part of my childhood. So it might surprise you to find out my experience with the generation in between those two included none of that. Johto was my blind spot. I've seen maybe five episodes of the anime because it never had reruns. The only trading cards I own, I got from a friend. I have three Entei cards. I don't know how. Check your couch cushions, you'll probably find one. Uh, no toys growing up. Gen 2 is pretty much a fever dream to me. I don't think any of this is real. There's just no way I could have missed so much media. And yet... Silver and gold exist, and I played them when I was seven. My story with Gen 2 starts on the Halloween of 2005. I was trick-or-treating with my sister, dressed as not a sand shrew, and for some reason I decided to ring my parents' doorbell to see what they'd do. And to my surprise, my dad plopped a Game Boy game into my pumpkin. And that's how I got my copy of Pokemon Silver. Oh my god, man. A new Pokemon game? Yeah, I'm going back inside. I don't need to see the King Size Snickers guy two blocks down. This is more important. Years later, and honestly, I'm not a big fan of the game. As a sequel, Silver does a ton to expand the world of Pokemon, but... All of its new ideas and mechanics produce an overambitious mess. It's really hard for me to compliment anything without saying something bad. When I first got into the Pokemon fanbase, Silver, Gold, and Crystal were commonly cited as the series' best games. And I can never agree. The nostalgia I have for Silver isn't as strong as Red or Sapphire. And playing it, I've always had this feeling that something is off. But we'll get into all of that in this video. Without further ado... Pokemon Silver. So right when you start the game, it asks for the time and day of the week, which is already nothing like the first generation. So many new mechanics and events are dependent on this feature, and it expands how players can experience their adventure. I'll explain them as they become relevant, but being so advanced comes with a glaring drawback. And that's the low battery life. Pokemon games use a battery to save their data, and they last a long time. My childhood copies of Red and Yellow still work to this day. Silver doesn't. Because it's always tracking the time when you aren't playing, the battery for Gen 2 games drains fast. Roughly seven years. And what makes this issue worse is that when the battery dies, the file is erased and saving is impossible. My copy of Silver died two years after I got it. And because I had no idea what was wrong with it, I bought a copy of Gold. And then that battery died not long after. Replacing the battery isn't an issue, but every time I'm in the mood to play these games, it seems like I gotta drive to Home Depot to buy another fucking battery. That's why I bought silver on my Nintendo 3DS. Because in 28 years, doing battery math, this will be the cheaper alternative. But getting into the game, we're already picking our starter. And the choices are Chikorita, Totodile, and Cyndaquil. I love them all, but from day one, I've been Team Cyndaquil. I don't have a cool story for this one, like Squirtle and Torchic, but I keep naming them Hugo for no reason. And now that we can finally explore Johto, I'll share my biggest problem with these games. Johto is Kanto 2.0. Where are the new Pokemon? Gold and Silver added 100 new ones, 50 less than the first games, and that's not a problem. I just hate how elusive they all are. Most of them aren't available in the wild or require a sacrificial lamb to obtain, and because of that, since I was a kid, these games felt kinda bootleg -y. Like, I recognize this is a new game, but besides my starter, everything has been there, done that. And every route does this. Every trainer does this. New Pokemon are so infrequent, and I never see people talk about it. But there are new Pokemon in the first route. Sentret's a barely worse Rattata, and Hoot Hoot, who's only available at night. A new feature with time is that Pokemon's encounter rates fluctuate during the day. Nocturnal creatures are lively at night, and others in the morning. As a concept and world building mechanic, this is great. It encourages you to revisit routes to find new Pokemon, but in practice, it's really annoying. If I want to use Lediba, I'm basically expected to start my file the moment I wake up. They're only available from 4 to 10 in the morning, the first hour of the game. If I miss the opportunity, I'm not going back to catch one and grind it up to match my team. And there's many other Pokemon with restrictions like that. But entering Route 30, we get an egg, which is another new mechanic. And for the uninitiated, this is a big one. 
Pokemon. Pokemon can have sex now with each other. Later on, there's a facility to engage in trafficking, which allows you to get some brand new Pokemon, and in some instances, teach Pokemon attacks they can't normally learn. Baby Pokemon are a new genre of creature. And I hate them. Like, it's not that these are ugly or anything. Megby is my boy. But when I'm playing Silver, I'm using Johto Pokemon. And the babies evolve into Kanto Pokemon. So disregarding all the shenanigans to even produce one of these things, they're already written off. The only exception is Togepi, coming from this egg. I like Togepi. Because of the anime, it's an honorary Gen 1 Pokemon. But in-game, I haven't given it a shot. Eggs hatch from walking, and by the time Togepi's ready to go, it can be 10 levels behind. It learns Metronome early on, and its evolution can fly, so there's some redeeming qualities but I usually stick with Zubat. Another thing Johto does besides adding pre-evolutions to old Pokemon is giving them new evolutions too. And Zubat can become a Crobat, but only with the help of yet another new mechanic, happiness. By winning fights, leveling up, getting haircuts, consuming vitamins, and walking, basically turning themselves into a fuckboy, Pokemon can use the power of friendship to evolve. It takes forever and eight new Pokemon need this, so that's annoying. And yet another new mechanic that's relevant to Route 30 is the Pokegear, which primarily acts as a phone. Plot events are communicated through this, but its most notable feature is you can trade numbers with other trainers. The last for a rematch, tell you when rare Pokemon are swarming, leave you 14 voicemails when they're drunk, and more often than not, waste your time. Is this what having friends is like? I'm an introvert, you wanna call me? Don't. <laughs> this is why I carried an iPod Touch until 2021. I only display maidenless behavior at the highest degree. Even my mom's in the DMs. You can choose to send her money you win after battles. Honestly, the most disrespectful thing you can do to someone is rob them and flex that you love your mama at the same time. And when she calls, she'll say she wasted a grand on toys to decorate your bedroom. Not in front of the hose, mom, but thank you. I love you. You want to hear the most uneducated and out-of-pocket theory? I thought this game took place in Greece as a kid. There's a temple, monks, everyone wears a kimono. How could I possibly be wrong? I didn't even know what country Greece was in. And what makes this so funny to me is that Johto is the Japanese country in the Pokemon games. Route 32 has two new Pokemon I'll be using, Mareep and Wooper. Mareep was an instant hit with me. I've been guilty of only using my starter as a kid, but Mareep was the Pokemon to finally buck that trend. For the first time ever, I was rotating two Pokemon, and I can't imagine Imagine a playthrough of Johto without my darling Ampharos. Pokemon Crystal is the third, improved version of Silver and Gold, and literally the only reason I can't respect it as a game is because the Mareep family got obliterated from existence. Wooper is a silly little guy, and I'd go as far as to say it's the most popular Johto Pokemon. I don't think I've gone a single month on Twitter without seeing a meme of it or Quagsire on my timeline. Wooper doesn't show up during the day, and as I've already said with Lediba, that's a problem. But something I learned right before this playthrough is that you can change time whenever you want. So I don't have to pause my game for five hours just to catch a Pokemon. On the title screen, pressing down, select, and B opens a menu asking for a password, which is determined by my name, ID, and money. Using a website, I can plug in that information to generate a password and set the time to night. And now, one of the biggest hurdles I thought I'd face making this video has been reduced to a minor inconvenience. Next door is the Ruins of Alf, home of my least favorite Pokemon, the alphabet. Unknown's an odd gimmick. Living organisms modeled after English letters. They learn one move, have no stats. Game-wise, they're pointless. But their unsettling existence in the anime somewhat redeems them. And even more unsettling is the illegal poaching of slowpokes for their tails. Team Rocket's back, and whatever they got going on is disappointing and pathetic. Silver and Gold take place three years after Red and Blue, and at the end of those games, Giovanni disbanded Team Rocket. He took a mental health break and overdosed on ear medication, maybe died in a ditch, but Team Rocket is still alive, baby, and they are unemployed, 
homeless, and jumping into wells like it's the Great Depression. And one man they brush shoulders with is Kurt, who lets us create brand new Pokeballs with Apricorns, fruit some trees grow. These Pokeballs have special properties like improved odds against heavy Pokemon or once found fishing. This one specifically will help with Grimer, Magnemite, and Tangela. And maybe the coolest one is the Friend Ball, which improves Pokemon's happiness and shows Pokeballs have the potential to do more than just catch Pokemon. And on the topic of trees, they also grow berries with effects like restoring HP and healing status conditions. A new mechanic this generation is hold items. If you give your Pokemon a berry, they'll eat it when their health is low. Other items can boost their damage, earn more money, let you run from wild battles no matter what. They're basically equipable accessories from every other RPG, but nonetheless, it's still a fantastic addition to include. Another tree can be headbutt to find more wild Pokemon. Johto is the worst when it comes to progression based attacks your Pokemon must learn. There's 7 HMs, which is already 2 more than the last time, and a Another two TMs you'll need for unrestricted access to the world. HMs can be annoying, but they are useful in battle. Surf, Strength, and Fly at least are powerful enough you'd use them regardless of their utility, and anyone who hates Flash obviously hasn't used it before. But Johto has three water type HMs, which means you are catching a fish and they will not have independence. When nine of your 24 attacks are chosen for you, it suffocates the flexibility you have for team building. I need a Pokemon for cut, but my whole team is incapable of learning. It. So my only option is to replace the Pokemon I want to use for dead weight, or contract a parasite in the woods. Golden Red City is the big city town. It's got the huge ass mall, a train station, radio station, and the franchise's most infamous gym leader. Whitney only has a Clefairy and a Mill Tank, but for whatever reason, that Mill Tank is a demon. It hits hard, has fat defenses, can stun your Pokemon with a track and stop, and has the ability to drink its own milk. Every time I replay Silver, I get really excited for Whitney because I know it'll be a tough fight. And every single time, I beat her first try. She didn't even use rollout. What the hell? I think the reality is that flash and smokescreen are so good, they expedite the threat. I rarely use status moves in Pokemon, but in Gen 2, it's a necessity. Accuracy drops, confusion, paralysis, and flinching are all strategies I use frequently. And that's because the difficulty in this game is constantly shifting. But we'll address that later. North of Goldenrod is this game's replacement for the Safari Zone. The Bug Catching Contest, which is a massive downgrade. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, you can play once using only 20 Pokeballs for the whole day. But the good news is that the wild Pokemon can't run, and you can use your own Pokemon to whittle down their health. So catching anything is drastically easier. The Pokemon available aren't really good but joining my team for the second game in a row is Scyther. Scyther is an all-time favorite, you should already know that, and in Generation 2, it got a new evolution. Caesar. Unfortunately, Caesar requires a post-game item to evolve, the Metal Coat, and to make things worse, it needs to be traded while holding the Metal Coat to evolve. Because of that, Last year, I played through Pokemon Gold just so I could use a Caesar in this video. And on the mention of that, I wanted to see if I could beat the game using only my starter, because I haven't tried doing that since I was a kid, and making these videos has made me nostalgic for that experience. And let me tell you, Typhlosion is fucking nasty. It literally steamrolled the entire game. It never fainted, never was endangered, just spam flame wheel, headbutt, and smoke screen, and everything explodes. It was immaculate. And now I wonder how easy the other games would be if I sold them today. Anyways, Scizor has a brand new type, Steel, which resists 11 of the 17 types and is immune to poison. Absolutely monstrous defensively, which is why Steel types are very uncommon. Another new type is Dark which is notable for having an immunity to psychic attacks, but it's also hard to find. Everyone online seems to agree that Dark and Steel being introduced, as well as Ghost being patched as a super effective type, and the special stat being split into special attack and special defense were all done to nerf psychic Pokemon. Except they aren't? I honestly think Psychic is more powerful this generation. Admittedly, I never took the complaint seriously in Gen 1 because I could always handle Alakazam. 
But look at this cheeky man sprite. He knows I can't touch him. Literally every psychic type shreds through my team. But also, having that pushback made the game fun. Again, accuracy dropping, confusion, and paralysis are strategies I use, and the opportunities they provide make for a very unique experience. What isn't unique is the return of roadblocks. In Sapphire and Red, I've mentioned countless times how the game stunned your progression by gatekeeping key items to random NPCs, and Silver is the most guilty of this design. If you want to cross the ocean or battle the fifth gym leader, you need to find Larry Michaels in room 6 on the 4th floor of Apartment Complex E, located on 33rd Street South at 7 in the morning on Friday if it's foggy. I finally learned my lesson and was talking to every NPC by the time I started Silver, but nothing prepared me for pseudo wudo. It doesn't react to HMs, so I needed something else, like a polka flute. But figuring out what and where to go was aggravating. I wound up retreading every single city looking for whatever it was I needed. And it turned out to be a watering can from Goldenrod's flower store. Ecruteague City is the heart and soul of Silver and Gold. Legendary Pokemon live here, and the essence of this region permeates in its history. One location you'll have to pass is the Dance Theater, where Kimono Girls fight using the Evolutions. There were three before, and two more now, Espeon and Umbreon, another two of this generation's most popular Pokemon. Again, I've never been too drawn to the Evolutions, but these two are definitely cooler. By talking to Bill in the Pokemon Center, you can visit him in Goldenrod to receive an Eevee. But forget that, my man's invented time travel? Yeah, using his time capsule, you can trade Pokemon between red, blue, yellow, and silver, gold, and crystal. A required method to complete the Pokedex in these games. So I don't know what the general consensus for this feature is. Today, transferring Pokemon has become a subscription service. But even before that, I never had a desire to bring my Pokemon over to new games. All they're gonna do is sit in the PC. But I imagine transferring up was really popular for anyone looking to euthanize their Charizard with Battery Erasure. Ecruteague's legendary Pokemon will be saved for Endgame, but the city has what I think is the game's hardest gym leader, Morty. He's a ghost type specialist, but he's just a regular guy. I don't know, maybe you'd catch him walking out at a festival. Morty sucks because his Gengar puts your team to sleep and chomps on their dreams, and while Hypnosis has a 40% chance of missing, I swear to god it's zero. Gen 2 has some bullshit under the hood when it comes to hacks, because whenever I get put to sleep, confused, attracted, paralyzed, frozen, accuracy dropped, anything that can prevent me from attacking, it happens every single turn. But when the computer has these problems, it breaks through, gets the 10% bonus effect, and crits me like it didn't just win the lottery. I haven't whited out in a Pokemon game as much as I did this playthrough, and every time it was because the one in quintillion chance I could lose, happened. Fuck this game. Olivine City has the last Pokemon I'll be using, Chin Chow. I've said this before, but there was a really brief week in my life where Lantern was my all-time favorite Pokemon. The year before I got Silver is the year I learned about Anglerfish, which is one radical animal. Another favorite Pokemon here is Shuckle, who really should be in the squad over Crobat. Shuckle's defenses are the highest in the series, and because of that, in later generations with the move Power Trick, Shuckle can do the most damage in a single turn which is over a billion. You don't fuckle with Shuckle. And for the first time in the game, a gym leader isn't immediately accessible. And that's because Jasmine is in Olivine City's lighthouse. Her Ampharos is sick, so we need to swim across the country for medicine because whoever designed this building forgot to add a door. Like, I can't get over how dooky this design is. To reach the top floor, people need to jump into a hole and break their ankles. And then to get out, they have to do it again. But with the task completed, we can fight Jasmine who uses the franchise's scariest Pokemon, Steelix. Whenever this thing showed up in the anime, I was worried Ash and the gang were gonna die. Like, it's a 50-story tall, massive metal snake with a strength to effortlessly burrow through rocks. Let me show you this Kevin Bacon movie poster to illustrate why it keeps me up at night. Mahogany Town has Team Rocket's second appearance, and they're using radio signals to evolve Magikarp into Gyarados. And again, this is a weird scheme. In red and blue, I never questioned why Team Rocket was at Mount Moon or Lavender Town, because they appeared so much, the strangeness of their actions never mattered. But in silver and gold, Team Rocket actually has a goal besides money and power, and because of that, 
Amputating slowpoke tails and manipulating fish feels really disjointed from their mission. We'll learn about that in their next appearance, but first, I gotta talk about this red Gyarados in the Lake of Rage. Started in Gen 2, Pokemon have a 1 in 8,000 chance of being miscolored. It's a fun little phenomenon, a special moment, and catching one of these Pokemon gives you all kinds of bragging rights. But nowadays, shinies are really lame. Most of them are ugly colors, and they become super easy to acquire. You know, some people will throw away months of their lives just to get one. Fuck, I did it at one point. Saying you hashed 1600 eggs or soft reset a legendary 4000 times to get a shiny doesn't make you tenacious, resilient, or cool. It means you're a dumbass, really. All that for a radioactive espion? My god. Anyways, Team Rocket's big ol' mission is that they want to get Giovanni back. Yeah, new management sucks, and they're driving everybody out. We've all been there, but dick riding your ex-boss for three years is wild. Bro, just quit the job. Pick up a McDonald's application, it ain't gonna get better. And the plan to get Giovanni is not good at all. Team Rocket hijacks the country's only radio station and broadcasts, Giovanni, can you please come back? Pretty please? This is what you've been cooking for three years? Spongebob Squarepants Gary come home sounding ass plan? Y'all really should have just stuck with a slowpoke BS. Wasting my goddamn time. Team Rocket fell off, and the fact that me interrupting this lame ass scheme broke them up again makes this the worst evil organization in any Pokemon game. What also sucks about this part of the game is the level balancing. Following Red and Blue, you can collect the 5th, 6th, and 7th badges in any order, but this time around around, the game's difficulty plateaus, and for several hours you're battling Pokemon that are underleveled and unthreatening. And with how long the Team Rocket segment lasts, it deflates a lot of the game's momentum because of how easy it is to steamroll everyone, unless you get the awful RNG I've been dealing with. But when the game finally picks itself back up, it gives us one of my favorite dungeons in the series. Ice Path is full of sliding floor and strength puzzles that actually make you think. And as a kid, it gave me so much trouble. Usually you can muscle through caves by stumbling into the egg exit, but here you gotta memorize a 15 move sequence while also having a fully unlocked object permanent skill tree. Not an easy ask for a 7 year old, I hated this place, and when I finally got to leave, I was so excited to never have to go inside again. Blackthorn City has the last gym leader, and Claire kinda sucks. I didn't mention this with Whitney, but when you beat her, she cries about it and doesn't give you the badge right away, which is awkward and stupid. And Claire does it too, except she makes a whole show about it. You beat me? That can't be right. Were you perhaps... Cheating? I actually like how Claire does it, because her ego is so big, she's like, I ain't a loser to no bitch, so you better become champion, otherwise y'all make me look fucking dumb as hell. Anyways, go in this cave and pick a seahorse tooth off the ground to prove your worth or something, I don't know, then you can have the badge. And with that final badge, I can use the Waterfall HM. Where the hell is the Waterfall HM? It really wouldn't be a Pokemon video without me missing some key item and resetting my game. And this is where that happened in Silver. I was talking to every NPC and doing a fantastic job about getting key items, HMs, fishing rods, the works. And I still ran into a game ending roadblock. I couldn't find Waterfall, and until my battery died, this is as far as I got. And that's because Waterfall is in the one place I refuse to ever visit. Ice path, just a little off the beaten path. If I had to guess, my inventory was full and I never bothered checking out the Pokeball. Silver and Gold upgraded the inventory and divided it into categories like TMs, key items, and Pokeballs. So it takes longer to max it out. You don't have to visit the PC as frequently to discard all your items. And when I was a kid, I never even knew this was a feature. So once my bag filled up with stuff I didn't want to sell, that was it. I just didn't pick up items because I couldn't. So why bother trying? and that's what's kept me from ever beating Silver. Believe it or not, but the Let's Play I did in 2019, 13 years later, was the first time I ever got further than this part of the game. From this point on, we're in uncharted waters, and that starts with the Kanto region. So the last thing I could do was get a little taste of illegal immigration. Just west of my home is Kanto, and if we keep going north, we'll eventually make it to Victory Road, which is almost identical to how it is in the older game. So that's a cool little easter egg, and waiting at the end is our rival. I haven't talked about this game's rival yet, because I don't really care about them. Silver does a fine job appearing at random places and using a balanced team, but he's a dickhead that's irrelevant to the story. His whole shtick is that he wants to use strong Pokemon because they're better. 
and he's not wrong, but the game angles him as a bully who gives knuckle sandwiches and swirlies in the bathroom. He probably plays his music 60 decibels too loud in the back of the classroom, and teachers send him to DRR on the regular. In the remakes, the rival is retconned as Giovanni's son. But the only way to learn that was to visit a GameStop in February or March in 2011. Also, during this DLC, it's revealed Giovanni heard the radio and was on his way to rejoin Team Rocket. But because we time traveled to his apartment and shot him in the head, that totally better ending doesn't have to happen. Thanks, Game Freak. Finally, I can face the Elite Four, but first, let me just comment how bizarre it is that my Pokemon are level 34. My starter isn't even fully evolved yet, and it's the end of the game. What even is this? It has to be an effect of the level curve flatlining for half of the game. Because so many trainers use weak Pokemon, it causes our Pokemon to be weak, which I think is also the reason I have to rely so heavily on status moves this generation. But back to the Elite Four, I like how the trainers aren't all the same. Bruno is the only person still on the cut, and seeing Koga get promoted is a pretty neat surprise. Lorelai and Agatha died and got replaced, and the introduction of Karen was a big day for annoying people. Truly skilled trainers should try to win with their favorite Pokemon. Pokemon has a competitive scene, and within that community they rank and ban Pokemon depending on how good they are. Stronger Pokemon get used more, and there's a vocal minority of people who are infuriated that their favorite Pokemon aren't viable. But also, I don't even think they understand what they're debating. Like they're mad people would rather win? than win with their favorites, in a set of rules they don't even have to play by. So Karen has become the poster child for their crusade to make Sunkern equal to Zapdos. It's a perfect quote right before the champion, who is not afraid to use their favorite meta-defining Pokemon three times. So in red and blue, the champion was your rival, a fitting final boss, and it ended with us becoming the new strongest trainer in the world. And with Silver and Gold being direct sequels, it would be really perfect if the character we were is the final boss of these games. We'll have to settle for the third strongest person. Lance is a guy who helped us fight Team Rocket in Mahogany Town, and that's it. He's meant to be the foil to our rival, I guess, because he uses strong Pokemon, but is a good person. But Lance is the real deal. He's one of the series' hardest champions, and that's because of his three Dragonites. I mean, his whole team is stocked with Hyper Beam, but Dragonite stats make them really hard to knock out and live hits from. Like, I have no idea what I would have done without an ice type attack. My entire strategy was to pass the ball to Tucker by reducing their opportunities to attack with Thunder Wave and Smoke Screen, then pivot into Quagsire to get the kills and heal up my team. During my Let's Play, Lance was not playing around and crit me so many times, I'm still angry about it. Name a more iconic high jello moment than this one. No crit, no crit, no crit. No crit! No crit! That is bullshit! Oh my god! Are you fucking kidding me? Please don't watch any of my Let's Plays unless you want to hear a college student with no life experience complain about reading Dracula while playing Super Mario Galaxy with a shitty microphone for 9 hours. But that's Lance, and as you may have been able to figure out, this is the furthest I've ever gotten silver. This is where my Let's Play ended, and because I didn't want to go into post-game blind, I just opted to play Super Mario Maker 2. I have completed the post-game in the remake when that released, but I don't remember anything about it. So in reality, I'm playing this part of the game for the first time. And Pokemon Silver and Gold have the most exciting post-game in the series, because we get to explore the rest of Kanto, the entire region from Red and Blue, three years later. This is something I've been looking forward to because back when Silver and Gold were seemingly the most popular games in the franchise, everyone lauded how Kanto doubled the game's length. You're visiting another country and collecting eight more badges, and that's where the discussion ends. I really don't remember anyone talking about the post-game despite its endless praise, and it wasn't until a few generations later when people started to give it a lot more attention and everyone apparently hates this part of the game, so what better opportunity to make an opinion for myself than to finally experience Silver's post-game firsthand? First of all, let me remind you that I'm a Gen 1-er, so the bar is gonna be low. 
and the second I heard the remix of the Trainer Battle theme, I was instantly a fan. You know, I like Silver and Gold soundtrack, but I never listened to it as background music, so I've never heard any of the Kanto songs, but listening to them for the first time locked me in to enjoy this post game. And it kicks off by starting us in Vermilion City, which is where a majority of cities conglomerate, so there's a ton of freedom in the direction you want to go. And unlike Red and Blue, there's no restrictions like HMs to gatekeep which cities I have access to, so I can tackle the gyms in any order I want. But there still are roadblocks, and I love how they're handled. So in this chunk of land, there's only two ways to visit the west side of the region, Diglett Cave and Route 19, and both of those paths are blocked. So we get this really unique puzzle where, using my knowledge from the previous games, I have to figure out how to access that part of the country. The game nudges us to visit the power plant, which we learn is out of service because the last Team Rocket grunt in the world didn't get the memo that he's unemployed, and the messed up part is that this one guy with broken English does more destruction and leaves a bigger impact than the entirety of Team Rocket did for three years. Cutting off the region's power means the newly built radio tower in Lavender Town and Magnetron in Saffron City are inaccessible. But even after restoring power to the plant, none of the roadblocks are affected. One of them is a Snorlax, who I know needs a Poke Flute to wake up, so I headed to Lavender Town to get one for Mr. Fuji, who had no interest in helping me. As it turns out, a station on the radio plays the flute's melody, which is a really unexpected solution that I'm really glad was included. But my Poke Gear doesn't have the radio app. I was actually stoked to encounter this kind of roadblock. This is the nostalgia itch I've been craving. Having to find a key item in an old school Pokemon game, I can't wait. And luckily for me, I found it right away at the Goldenrod radio tower. Now I'll just ride the train back to Kanto and... I'm not itching anymore. With the radio app and lullaby channel, I can wake up Snorlax. And, uh, we haven't talked about a Pokemon in a while. Did you know Snorlax is the best Pokemon in Silver and Gold's competitive scene? Like, 100% of serious teams use Snorlax. It is the meta. And on the topic of Pokemon, there's a lot of Johto Pokemon you can't acquire until you visit Kanto. And I think this is one of the worst sins a Pokemon game can do. Restricting Pokemon new to the generation? to the post-game. Houndoom, May Cargo, Mistrevis, Murkrow, Sneasel, Caesar, Steelix, Tyranitar, Octillery, Blissey, Porygon 2, Alakid, Pichu, Cleffa, and one of Lugia or Ho-Oh. One-fifth of this game's new Pokemon are gate kept by Kanto. That's not good. And the other complaint I gotta make is that Kanto is a ghost town. And all the big attractions are inaccessible, and it turns the region into such a downer. The Safari Zone is closed because the Warden's on vacation, Selfco and Team Rocket's hideout are blocked off, Lavender Tower was desecrated so a radio station could blast Leonard Skinner 24-7, caves like Mount Moon and Cerulean Cave got hit with dynamite, and Viridian Forest ain't even a forest anymore. It actually cracks me up. The way they got rid of the Pokemon Mansion and Seafoam Islands was to invent a volcano on Cinnabar Island that erupted and destroyed everything, causing Blaine to move his gym into a dinky little cave at Seafoam. Like, you know everyone at the office was high-fiving each other when they realized they could get away with that one. This is one of the most well-known facts about Silver and Gold, but in development, future president of Nintendo, Satoru Iwata, reworked so much code on the game that, because of him, Kanto could even be in the game in the first place. So I imagine removing all these dungeons was a sacrifice they had to make because it was already a miracle fitting in as much as they could. With this game taking place three years later, there's just one thing missing. Where are my bitches? Where are Red and Blue? Blue may not be the champion, but he's become Giovanni's successor as a gym leader, and instead of focusing on a specific type, he uses his in-game team. Red, on the other hand, is saved as the final, final boss. Atop Mount Silver, the reward for collecting all 16 badges, we can fight ourselves. I've always heard about this moment being an all-time reason Silver and Gold are so beloved. A super boss in a Pokemon game and it's the protagonist from the prequel. Red's Pokemon are around level 80, 20 levels above blue, the next strongest trainer. My Pokemon are 46. Most people start the battle realizing they're out of their league and grind a substantial amount until they're close enough to stand a chance. But I'm not most people. If this were any other game, I think I'd have to grind. But I got a team of Pokemon whose entire game plan is to confuse, paralyze, reduce accuracy, and flinch. 
and I'm taking them to the top, baby. The highlights of this fight is Espeon solidified that psychic types are as busted as ever, doing lethal damage to my team, but the real monster is Snorlax. If you doubt that this thing is the strongest Pokemon in the meta, I say you should battle it with the conditions I was working against. It's so fat, my attacks bounce off, and with rest and its artillery, knocking it out is a fantasy, but... Then I remembered Rock Smash, a useless move I gave Ampharos. It has a 50% chance of lowering its target's defense, which means with enough stat drops, I might be able to take it down. And it worked. I just had to trip away the last few Pokemon, and Red is defeated, ending the story of Pokemon Silver. But we still got some legendary Pokemon to catch, and in this generation, they are all a pain in the ass. Lugia and Ho-Oh start the trend of box legendaries, legendaries exclusive to a game, except in these games you can catch both. The first is available after Team Rocket's radio hijinks, and the second is gatekept by some random schmuck in Pewter City. Lugia and Ho-Oh both know Recover, which restores their HP and cripples your ability to catch either of them. Like I just got to a point where I'd rather throw Pokeballs at health and waste 4 minutes whittling it down for one good throw with a 1% better odd of succeeding. Those aren't even the worst ones, and Ekrotique's Burnt Tower are the legendary dogs. Zentei, Suicune, and Raikou got that dog in him. After releasing them from the tower, they will roam Johto, and it's miserable tracking them down. They move when you move, and if by some miracle you're in the same route together, they only have a 10% encounter rate. When I was a kid, I saw Entei once, and it was such a cool surprise. That's the Pokemon from the card on my couch, but alright, we found it. Now let's try to catch it. They can run away on the first turn. The only solution is to use Mean Look, but the dog said fuck that, use Roar, and force me to run away. And like I said, it's not exactly easy to find them again, and because of Roar, risking using Mean Look can waste the encounter because if they Roar turn 1, you can't even throw a Pokeball, and with the bad luck I have in this game, you know that was happening every single time. In the end, it took me 5 hours to get all 3, all of which were in the last hour right when I was about to give up. But if you thought those were hard, the last legendary is impossible to catch. Celebi is the new Mew, a Pokemon that exists, but doesn't. It was only available in Japan for people with a cell phone and a cable that connects it to a Game Boy, which is the most made up shit I've ever heard. Pokemon Crystal on the 3DS was updated to bypass those steps, and one more random thing I want to mention is that the Pokemon sprites in Silver and Gold are different from one another, which is a really extra detail, but the Gold sprites are almost always better, and the fact that Crystal borrows primarily from Gold solidifies that. Also Crystal animated the sprites, which confuses me, like could we not have used that extra space to get the Safari? Zone or something, but that's where we're gonna call it for Pokemon Silver, a game I'm really mixed on. As a sequel, it adds so much new content and goes the extra mile in many ways that I wanna say it's better than Red and Blue. But, as I said in the beginning, for every new feature, there's something to complain about. And I don't need to go over the list again, but they coalesce into a game that has a lot of freedom but is simultaneously restricting. Johto was that awkward generation in between the two that defined my childhood. I grew up with Silver and played it almost as often as Sapphire and Red, but it barely left an impression on me. The world I lived in didn't acknowledge it, so I didn't either. It's just not as fun. Nothing it does is better or extraordinary. It's a palate cleanser Pokemon game, one to revisit when you've played every other game. Does that make this the worst? Well, it was my least favorite as a kid, but I still feel positive about the game. My nostalgia for Gen 2 may not be as strong, but every time I play it, I know I'll have a good time. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a like as help the channel grow, and subscribe to get updates on my uploads as soon as they happen. Until then, I will see you all next time.